Luke chapter 8, 43 through 48, we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. If we're able, it is not mandatory. Nobody's going to come throw you out of the church if you don't miss Lisa. <laughs> and the King James text appears before you, and I read it today. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, <coughs> excuse me, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stenched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I would like to talk to us for a little while today on the topic, What can I do? What can I do? If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Master, we so love you today, and we are so grateful for the presence of the Lord that we have felt today in the house of God as we sang the wonderful old songs of the church. Every day I'm camping in the land of Canaan. Lord, uh, today we live in the promised land. You have promised us, God, that you came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And today, Lord, I can say in all truth that my life is better, it is blessed, it is more abundant because of your presence in it. And I do today live in the land of Canaan. Everything is not perfect. Everything is not roses and sunshine and butterflies. Life is hard in and of itself, but Lord, it's so much nicer and so much easier to go through this life when we have you in our side. Master, today the hour has come when the word of God must go forth. And I am unable, as a mere human being, I am unable to impart unto the people of God the divine wisdom and the divine word of God. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I humble myself, God, in your presence, and I ask, Lord, that you would anoint me in a special way to deliver this word. For, Lord, I know what you want to say. You've spoken it to my spirit, but I pray, God, that you would help me in conveying what you've spoken to me to the people of God that they might benefit thereby. Master, I ask, God, that every ear would be open to hear and receive that which the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church at this hour. Let every individual under the sound of my voice have an open heart and open mind and open ears to not only hear but to receive the imparted Word of God. We ask it all in that blessed sacred name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. So sandwiched between the two segments of the story that I shared with you last week is the story of a woman who through relentless perseverance pushed her way through to a miracle from the Lord. Amen. This little lady was not going to be stopped. She had made up her mind. I don't need, I don't believe that I need to have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus. I don't believe that I necessarily...
necessarily have to talk to this man. I don't believe, Bill, that he necessarily has to lay his hands on me for me to be healed. I'm convinced from what I've heard about this man, I'm convinced that the power to heal just emanates from him. It just flows from him. So therefore, all I have to do is sneak up under the legs of this crowd, push my way through all these people, and grab hold of the very hem of his garment, the bottom of his garment. That's all I have to do. And I believe that I'll receive my healing. She had spent all her money on doctors. The word of God said she spent all her living. How many people in our world today, especially in good old America, where health care is some sort of a privilege for the wealthy and not available to everybody, how many people we know today have spent all their living and yet still they're not better? You know the thing that kills me about health care I don't know how many times I've gone to a doctor or how many times, not so much my doctor because my doctor's pretty good, but I've gone to the emergency room and probably you've experienced this too. And you go to the emergency room and basically they keep you there for all oh, eight or ten hours and when they're all done, they look at you and say, well, we really don't know what the problem is. You ever had that happen? Don't you just love when you spend half a day or a day at the hospital in the emergency room just so they can look at you and say, well, we really don't know what the problem is. I want to look at them and say, good, then I'm really not going to pay you. <laughs> hey, let's be honest now. Why should I pay for you to come up with no answers? Why should I pay when you haven't decided and you haven't been able to figure out what the problem is? Yet, yeah, Johnny, here comes that hospital bill, and it's for thousands of dollars. I paid thousands of dollars so a doctor could tell me I don't know what the problem is. Well, that's where I was before I went to the hospital. I didn't know what the problem was either. I could have stayed home, saved thousands of dollars, and just come to the same conclusion. Isn't it funny that in the medical profession you pay whether they figure it out or not? Isn't it funny in the medical profession you pay whether or not they're able to treat it? They pay whether or not you get better. They pay whether or not uh, any final determination is made. Isn't it something that that's how things work? Well, apparently things weren't much different in biblical times. <laughs> this lady still had to pay even though she was never healed. I'm going to tell you folks, it isn't hard to understand that in, in, in modern America. It isn't hard to understand how you can pay all kind of money and still never get what you need. She spent all her living. She was broke. I put a picture on, on our sermon uh, illustration of a person on the phone. And I have the question, what can I do? I imagine that lady spoke to a lot of people and said, what can I do? I've spent all my money. I've used all my income. I don't have any more resources. What can I do? How many people in our world today are asking the question, I don't have any resources. I've run out of resources. What can I do? Johnny, people contact me all the time who are part of the LGBT community and they'll say to me, can you tell me how it is that you can be LGBT and still be a Christian? I have people ask me that. And I'll say to them, listen, we have a website that is devoted entirely to this question, entirely to this issue. You need to go to this website, and you need to read some of the Bible studies, and you need to read some of the articles that I've written on this website, www.gaybelievers.org. 
I've spent years and years writing articles and Bible studies on subjects that are designed to help LGBT believers come to reconcile their faith with who they are as a member of the LGBT community. And Lisa, do you know the response I get out of a lot of these characters? Take a wild guess. They get frustrated. They get aggravated. I don't want to have to go to a website. I don't want to have to read something. I don't want to have to research. I don't want to have to do I want you to just hand me the answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I got news for you, folks. I've got a life, too. I've got responsibilities. I've got things to do. As much as I would love to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week on my computer answering people's questions and answering questions that I've only answered 10,000 times before, answering questions that I have addressed through study and through research that I've written articles about and I've written Bible studies about so that you could have all the information, all of it, in a nice, orderly, organized fashion to help you understand the issue. As much as I'd love to spend all day every day doing nothing but sitting online typing to answer your personal question, I don't have that time. You need to go to this website. You need to read. But Lisa, they didn't call me asking me, what can I do? No, they called me asking me, what's the answer? Tell me the answer. I've got news for you today. Sometimes if you're going to get what you need, you've got to get off your duff. And do something about it. Hello now. This little lady was sick. She was out of resources. She was out of money. But she didn't sit around asking questions. She said, what can I do? I know what I can do. I can press through the crowd. I can crawl on my belly like a snake. I can do whatever I need to do to touch the hem of his garment. Oh my goodness, this wasn't a woman who was going to sit around waiting for Jesus to show up at her door, was she, Tommy? No, sir. She was willing to do what she needed to do. How many people in our community today are not willing to do what is necessary to find the answer to their question? Oh my God, don't let somebody come to me asking me questions about reconciling their faith with who they are as an LGBT person and have me say to them, why don't you come to our church? Why don't you visit our church? No, because that requires a God to do something. Yes, it does. I've got news for you. Your miracle, honey, is in the doing. The answer you need is in the doing. That if you're ever going to come to an understanding of this issue you're wrestling with, it's in the doing. Well, but the Bible said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Yes, it most certainly does say that, but it doesn't say ask me. But see, even asking is doing. How many of these people come to the preacher asking him for the answer when they ought to be going to God and asking him for the answer? I've told you the story about how I came to an understanding of the revelation of the oneness of God. It's when I finally asked God the question. Because for years I thought I already knew the answer, so I didn't bother asking, because why do you ask if you know the answer? A lot of people in our community, well, I already know the answer. I did that with God myself. When the Lord tried to speak to me years ago, when I first came out in 89, when God tried to speak to me about ministering to the LGBT community, grace, I was like, Lord, are you out of your mind? What voice am I hearing? Is this God or is this the devil? 
it must be the devil trying to imitate God because I know what the Bible says about all these subjects. I know what the Bible says about Sodom. I know what the Bible says about Romans 1. I know what the Bible says in Leviticus. Hello now. I knew the answers. As long as you know the answers, you don't ask the questions, do you? I knew all the answers, so if I know the answers, then ask and it shall be given unto thee. Well, that don't matter because I already know the answer. I got news for you, friend. Sometimes you need to ask the question that you think you already have the answer to because if you'll ask God, he'll tell you your understanding is wrong. Your understanding is not accurate. Your understanding is not in keeping with the truth of his word. Well, that's what I found out when I got out there and started investigating and started looking. I found out that the answer was different than what I thought. And I told you when I first went, I mean, the Holy Ghost was talking to me for about three years. The Spirit of the Lord kept trying to get me come back to church, come back to God. He wanted me, because the Bible said the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In other words, if God calls you to preach, he don't ever change his mind. You can be Jimmy Swigert and run off with a hooker and have your little fling, and you know what? God still called the man. And I don't, I'm very careful about picking on people that God has called, because the Word of God also said, Touch not mine anointed, nor do my prophet any harm. So if God's called, just because somebody's got human frailty and just because somebody's got faults and just because somebody has weaknesses in their life, that does not mean they're not called. Look at how many people Jimmy Swagger was able to reach over the many, many years he preached. Look how many people came into a knowledge of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's one of the things I give Jimmy Swagger a lot of credit for. I don't know how many tens if not hundreds of thousands of people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost because of his ministry. He was able to marvelously communicate and help people understand the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I know people from churches I've pastored. I know people from churches I've been a part of who received the Holy Ghost in response to Jimmy Swaggart's ministry. So just because there's frailty in a man or woman's life, just because there's sin even in a man or woman's life, does not mean they were not called of God. So the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Even when I was out of church, even when I was cursing and, and doing people dirty and acting the fool because I thought God hated me and God didn't want anything to do with me and I was a filthy old thing. I was a filthy old beggar and God didn't want nothing to do with me. Even when all that was going on, folks, I still had a calling on my life. And God kept trying to talk to me about fulfilling my calling, doing my job. Say, hey boy, I called you to preach. I went to my grandmother's house one day, Brother Tatlock. I've told you about Brother Tatlock. He was an old Jesus name preacher who was a friend of our family for many, many decades. An incredible man of God. I mean incredible. If you'd ever met him, you'd, you'd have been blown away. You talk about a man of faith. This man had faith that could move mountains. He really did. He had incredible faith. And I had just come out that same year, I believe it was, and I went to my grandmother's house. Brother Tatlock was there. When Brother Tatlock came, everybody and their brother would run to my grandparents' house because we all loved him and admired him and respected him. And everybody wanted to see him. Well, I happened to get there about first, so there was nobody else there. Now, here I am the same year I come out. And Brother Tatlock looks at me and he says, Well, Chuck, where are you preaching now? Oh. That's kind of a sore spot for a freshly backslid preacher. <laughs> I looked at him and I, I kind of put my eyes down. I said, well, Brother Tatlock, I said, I, I, I'm, I'm not preaching right now. I'm not preaching anymore. And he looked at me. He had a way of telling you. He did this all the time. He could cut you to the bone. <laughs> <laughs> with one sentence. And I mean, it'd be a short sentence. And he wasn't being malicious or hurtful, but when I say come to the bone, I mean he'd get to the point that fast. 
And he looked at me and he said, did God call you to preach? I said, I couldn't say no because I knew he did. And they, nobody going to tell me God didn't call me to preach. I may not be the greatest preacher on the planet. Some of you folks watching, they say, you bore the fire out of me. I'm not sure if God called you or not. But I know God called me. You don't have to know. I know. So I could not answer him no because I knew if I did that, God would be upset with me because I'd be lying. So I said, yes. And then he said, when did he tell you to quit? <laughs> Cut my head off, why don't you? I started to cry. My grandmother was sitting there. And I just started to bawl like a baby. When did he tell you to quit? What Brother Tatlock didn't know is that God was trying to tell me for a year that I still needed to preach. I still needed to do my job, but I needed to do it within my present situation. As a member of the LGBT community, I needed to minister to people in the LGBT community. That's what God was trying to tell me. And I could not hear it. Why? Because I thought I already knew the answers. It wasn't until my partner, I've told you the story of a few years, came into the faith, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name. It wasn't until then that I suddenly was faced with old booger. Now, if I don't, if I don't get right with God, I could cost him his salvation, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do anything that would, uh, you know, when somebody, uh, oh, I'm going to tell you, hell's hot for people who stand in the way of others. Some of you folks have got people who are getting in your way and they're trying to block you from getting to the Lord. They're trying to prevent you from finding God. They're trying to make sure that you never get to touch the hem of the Lord's garment. Now you can't be a Christian. You're, you're this, you're that. Now who you are prevents you. Oh, because what you do prevents you. Am I telling the truth now? We all have those people. Oh, they call themselves close to God. They call themselves, oh, I'm a Christian. I live close to the Lord. That's all right. I may not be pressed up against him, but I can still push through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment. Hallelujah. What I need does not require a face-to-face -face confrontation. What I need does not require him to lay hands on me. What I need does not require the Lord to converse with me. All I need to do is touch him. But if I'm going to do that, it's going to take effort. People love to quote that scripture. And I've talked about it last Sunday. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Uh, let's keep going. Seek and you shall find. Let's keep going. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Okay, I'm going to stand here and seek. Go hide something, and I'll just stand here and I'll find it, but I'm never going to move a muscle. I'll find it without moving a muscle. You ever play hide and seek when you were a kid? Now, can you imagine the other kids going off and hiding, and you just standing there saying, no, I'm too tired, I don't want to be bothered, I'll find you from here. Well, what if... The kid's hiding out of your view. What if the kid's nowhere near where you're at? If you're going to find them, you've got to seek them. If you're going to seek them, you're going to have to put forth some effort. You're going to have to put forth some energy. Uh, what can I do? Seek. What can I do? Knock. Well, when I visit my friend, I go up to his door, and I stand there, and I go, knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock, knock. He ain't coming. Ding dong. No. If I'm going to knock, I've got to put forth the effort to get my arm up in the air and start rapping on that door. Too many people want God to give them the answer. They don't want to look for the answer. Too many people want God to open the door. They don't want to knock on the door. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I remember when I was pastoring and affirming work in Connecticut many years ago, 
And one young lady called me on the telephone, a member of the LGBT community, called me on the telephone. She said, I am so afraid. Literally, this woman said this to me. She said, I am so afraid to walk into a church. I am so afraid that literally God is just going to strike me dead if I try to walk into a church. See, that is how much fear and rejection had been preached into her spirit by all these other nonsensical preachers who don't understand what grace is and don't understand how grace works. This poor woman was terrified. I said to her, I said, honey, I promise you, if you'll make the effort, if you're just going to sit where you're sitting, and you think somehow or another God is just going to bathe you with an understanding and a revelation that he receives you and he accepts you. I said, you need to make an effort to touch the Lord. Everything God does, he does in response to us making the first move. Did you hear me now? The Bible said, draw nigh unto God, what? And he will draw nigh unto you. So if you're going to get the Lord closer to you, you've got to make the first move and you've got to try to get closer to him. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? See, that's how God works. Why? Because everything God does, he does through the realms of faith. So as we make an effort to draw closer to him, that little lady wasn't trying to touch the hem of his garment just because she wanted to do alterations. <laughs> no. She had it in her mind that if that's all I have to do to receive what I need, listen, if you get it in your mind, I can find the answer I need if I'll search the word of God. I can find the answer I need if I'll go to church. Now, I know there's a church that will receive me. I know there's a church that will accept me. They've told me a hundred times that I'm welcome there. I may not be welcome at the church I grew up in. I may not be welcome at first church down the road. I may not be welcome in 99% of the churches in Dallas. But there is one church that I've watched online. And I know for a fact that I'm welcome there. I know for a fact that I can walk in there. I want to find Jesus. I want to touch the Lord. I'm going to make the effort to draw nigh unto God. I'm going to go to church. How many in this building feel like you have found some answers since you started coming to church? Hallelujah. Isn't it funny? You made the effort and God honored your effort, didn't he? Amen. You made the effort and God honored your effort. You see, what a lot of these people don't realize is they miss, I know I did when I was out of church, they miss that being able to feel the presence of the Lord. They miss the communion of the Holy Ghost. They miss being around other believers and other saints. And what they don't know, Johnny, is that they would make the effort to come through that door that the Spirit of the Lord during the service is going to come down and he's going to wrap his arms around them just like he does us every Sunday. And he's going to let them know, honey, you are welcome in my church. Just because that church down the road won't take you. See, the problem is, uh, Bill, a lot of these people, they want me to give them an answer on the phone. They want me to give them an answer in person. They want me to give them an answer on the internet so that they can go back and argue at the church they grew up in. Well, I got news for you, honey. Just because what I tell you is the truth, that don't mean you're going to be able to convince those ninnies of anything. The fact of the business is, you're going to have to find another way to serve the Lord. You're going to have to find another church to serve God in, because that church ain't never going to come around. Trust me. So quit trying. But see, they literally want me to give them an answer so they can turn around and go argue with that pastor. And then that pastor is going to argue back with them. And they're not going to know the word of God well enough to argue back. And they're going to be coming, well, he must be right because, I mean, the pastor Charles told me this. And I told my pastor that. And my pastor didn't change his mind. And he said thus and so. And I didn't know how to answer him. That's why I told you to go to the website and read the Bible studies. That's why I told you to go to the website and read the article. 
because there is mounds of information there that I cannot speak to you in a matter of 10 minutes time. But it's going to take effort. It's going to mean you got to do something. It means you got to put a little effort into the equation. The truth of the matter is, when the Word of God tells us, ask, seek, and knock, two out of three of those items are do items. Asking, eh, that's a speech. That's a speak item. We talk about praying, talking to the Lord, going to God in prayer, asking Him for the answers. Well, there are times when you've got to really ask and you've got to be persistent. Last week, our message was about Jairus, and Jairus came, and he asked the Lord to come to his house to heal his daughter, right? And then the servant came and said, well, your daughter's died. You can quit asking the Lord to come. You can tell him to turn around and go back the other way because your daughter's died. And the Lord said, hey, if you can believe, this will be all right. So what did Jairus do? He asked again, said, all right, well, let's keep going then, Lord. Keep coming. If you said it's going to be all right, I believe it's going to be all right. Let's keep going. You see, so sometimes the answer to your dilemma is in the asking. But then a lot of times the answer to your dilemma is in the doing. You've got to seek. You've got to knock. You want that door to open? You've got to knock. You want to find what you're looking for? You've got to seek. It is not going to be handed to you on a silver platter. I've tried so many times to tell members of our community, if you will come to church, I promise you as sure as I'm alive, God will honor your faith and he'll give you the answers you're looking for. And if you come to this church and you sit and listen to this old chubby preacher preach and you don't hear and find the answers you're looking for, then you just go on out and leave and never come back. But you know what? I've never had one person come into this church that turned around and said, I didn't find what I was looking for. I can't think of any anyway. Maybe there have been some, but I can't think of them. Amen. So many want answers. But they'll not put forth the effort to ask. So many want to find, but they refuse to make the effort to seek. So many today want the door to open before them, but they will not put forth the effort to knock. Faith is demonstrated, folks, in our effort. You demonstrate your faith in doing. My Lord, have mercy. The woman with the issue of blood was willing to do whatever she had to do to touch the hem of the Lord's garment. And yet today, the people who are struggling for answers won't take the time to put forth the energy to open their Bibles or to go to church. Got news for you, folk. Lazy people will find your place in heaven. Lazy, did you hear me now? Lazy people will find no place in heaven. Faith is demonstrated through action. No action, no answer. No action, you won't find. No action, the door will remain closed before you. In James chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, the word of God declares, Even so faith, if it hath not works, meaning action. That this term in this passage literally means simply action. Even so faith, if it hath not works, action, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, I have actions. Show me thy faith without thy works. Show me your faith without your actions. And I will show thee my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith by my actions. Hello now. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, without action, is 
dead. Faith is demonstrated in action. The question we should be asking, that lady calling me on the phone in our in our illustration today, she shouldn't be calling me up and saying, give me the answer. She ought to be calling me up and saying, what can I do? What can I do to find the peace I need? What can I do to get back in relationship with God? What can I do to receive my healing? What can I do to find the answers that I need. I'll tell you what you can do. You can open your Bible. You can talk to God. You can ask God questions you think you already know answers to. Hello now. Ask the Lord for answers to questions that you already think you know the answers to. Because i got news for you. A lot of us, including me, weren't altogether raised right. We weren't, including me. The church I grew up in did not give me all the right answers, folks. That's why our relationship is with God and not with the church. That's why God has established that no denomination nor any organization represents him solely. Why? Because our relationship is with him. That denomination gets it wrong, we're led wrong. That denomination gets it wrong, we're up a creek. Hello now, because we're relying on the denomination. I relied for the first 16 years of my life, I relied on the Assemblies of God for all the answers to all my theological questions. It wasn't until several years later that I finally learned to rely on God for the answer, not the Assemblies of God. Hello now. Oh, my Lord, some people raise Jehovah's Witness and the Watchtower Bible Society said, you've got to rely on us. If you have an answer, if you have a question, we're the one to provide the answer. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you have no need that any man teach you. That's what the Word of God said. You have no need that any, that any, that means that's inclusive of all. Nobody's left out. Nobody has to teach you anything. If you'll ask God sincerely, if you'll search it out, if you'll knock, God will provide the answer you need. A lot of people in this community right here in Dallas today, oh my Lord, oh Lisa, how many times have Martin and you and I and Tommy and us, we've said at the Denny's and talked about, oh, and people, well, you know, Martin loves this little church, bless his heart, and I'm so grateful for him, and I'm so grateful for the love he has for this church, but Martin has said so many times, oh, if only people would come, my God, they don't realize what they could get out of it, they don't realize what doors would open to them, they don't realize the understanding that would come to them, if only they would make the effort, hadn't he said that? Many times. I think the same thing sometimes. I watch our messages online. After I've preached them and after I've published them to the internet, I listen to them. I've told you many times before, I listen to them for content. You've got to understand how the anointing works. While I'm up here preaching a lot of times, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm not even, I'm trying to plug into the Spirit of the Lord and let Him guide what I say and how I say it. A lot of times when I'm all done with my message, I couldn't tell you a whole lot about what I said. <laughs> so I'll go back and listen to it. And I listen to it as if I were somebody, Lisa, that just walked in off the street, sat down in the seat, you know. And literally, that's how I listen to my own preaching. I don't listen to it to, to glory in what I think are skills, because I got news for you, I don't think I have all those greatest skills. But I listen to it because it's the Word of God, and I want to hear the Word of God. So I'll listen, and I'm going to tell you, there are many times I've listened to sermons that have come off this pulpit, and my God, they have blessed me, and they've lifted me up, and they've opened my eyes, and I'm sitting there saying, Lord, have mercy if we could only get people to come through the door. Oh my God, can you imagine the revival we would have in the city of Dallas? Can you imagine the revival we would have in the LGBT community if only we could get people to start Start asking, what can I do? Quit waiting for the answer to come knock you on the head. Quit waiting for the answer to come beat you over the noggin. 
I've had people in this church, I've had people in other affirming churches I've pastored tell me, do you know, I didn't even realize, but it's been several months since I put a drink to my lips. They weren't trying to quit drinking. They weren't trying to cut down on their alcohol consumption. But just as their relationship with God grew, and as they drew closer to the Lord, Johnny, all of a sudden, they found themselves less and less and less doing this other thing. This preacher don't get up here and tell you, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. You're going to go to hell if you do this. You're going to go to hell to do that. No, the focus of this church is trying to help you to draw nigh unto God. Why? Because if you'll draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. And then what does it say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. See, you can have a big friend. You can, you can be this tall in middle school or high school and have a friend who's this big. But the bully will still pick on you as long as your big friend is in another part of the school. But don't let you be walking down that hallway and have your big friend walking right alongside of you because guess what? That bully ain't going to touch you. That bully ain't going to bother with you. Am I telling the truth? Matter of fact, when you got a big old monster friend next to you, you can probably walk over to that bully and go, boo, and he'll run screaming, right? Why? Because of who you got next to you. Draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The closer you are to the Lord, honey, the further the devil wants to be from you. He don't want to be around people who are walking close to God. He doesn't want to be around people. I'm telling you, they scare, the devil scared to death of people that walk close to God. I remember Dottie Rambo telling the story one time how she was... She had some health issues for a number of years that caused her immense pain, a lot of pain and a lot of struggle. And bless her heart, she wrote some of the most glorious gospel music. Even in her pain, she wrote some of the most wonderful southern gospel music. But Dottie said one day, Sister Vestal Goodman come over to see her. And she said, and Vestal come in the house. And she said, the minute Vestal walked in the house, she said, I could hear the devil say, oh, Lord, I'm leaving. Here comes that woman. <laughs> Why? Because Vestal walked close to God. Her relationship with God was tight. You hear me now? And anywhere Vestal went, the devil left. Oh, I'm going to tell you, it's the truth, folks. You get God, you get close enough to God in your life and the devil's going to run from you because everywhere you go, he sees your friend. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He sees that friend standing beside you. But the problem is a lot of people in our community have long ago abandoned the Lord. Long ago, they left the church. Long ago, they have no longer been walking in fellowship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you make the effort to draw nigh unto God, He has promised He'll draw nigh unto you. He doesn't put it all on you. But He asks you to make the first move. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you're going to get what you need to get, like that little woman with the issue of blood, you're going to have to do something. It's not about, give me the answer, hand me the answer. It's about, what can I do? Some people will sleep outside for days to buy concert tickets. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Or they'll travel for thousands of miles to meet somebody they met online. And yet, the issue of eternity is of so little consequence to them that they will not even make the effort to do some research or go to church. That's how much eternity means to them. Oh, you let them meet somebody online who lives 400 miles away, they'll drive 400 miles to meet that person online. Just don't ask me to go to church to find my answers because, no, I don't need to go to church. I'll just sit here and wait until God knocks me over the head and hands me the answers. People contact me all the time wanting me to answer their questions and quell their fears. But asking me to hand them the answer is not the same as seeking the answer. 
When I direct them to our LGBT Christian website or invite them to come to church, they act annoyed and march off angry that I would not simply hand them the answers. But listen to me today, children. If you haven't the faith to put forth the effort to find the answer, listen carefully, you will not have the faith to receive the answer if I hand it to you. Did you hear what I said? Faith is demonstrated in doing. Faith is demonstrated through effort. Faith is demonstrated through action. If you don't have the faith to look for the answer, then I can hand you the answer and you won't even have the faith to accept it when I hand it to you. You're still going to stand there and argue with me. You're still going to stand there and offer me arguments and tell me how I'm wrong and how that isn't right and I tell the truth. But if you'll put forth the effort to find the answer, then you're demonstrating faith and God responds to faith. And God becomes part of the equation. And he will open your eyes. He will cause you to have revelation and understanding. God will open your eyes and grant you revelation and understanding when you decide that the issue you which, uh, which you seek to settle is worthy of your time, worthy of your effort, and worthy of your energy. And not just worthy of a few words uttering a query. You know the old saying, talk is cheap. The question today is not, what can I say? But rather, what can I do? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?